Would you turn with me in your copy of God's Word to the letter of 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 4. First Peter chapter four this morning, we are in the home stretch of our study of First Peter. We'll begin looking at chapter four this morning, looking at the first six verses. Allergies have been uh, a burden to me this past week, so uh, hopefully I'll be able to get through this this morning without a lot of coughing. If you found your place in 1 Peter chapter 4, if you will stand with me in honor of the reading of the Word of God. 1 Peter chapter 4, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 6 this morning. This is what the Holy Spirit has inspired the Apostle Peter to write to the churches. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh... Arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you. But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that those judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. Father, we pray that you will add your blessing to your word this morning. May your spirit convict us and challenge us and encourage us to look to Christ. And we pray these things in his name. Amen. You may be seated. The cannibals. You'll be eaten by cannibals. This was the protest of an older gentleman to John G. Peyton when he expressed his desire to take the gospel to the inhabitants in the New Hebrides, a collection of islands in the South Pacific. Now this warning was a valid one because in the mid-1800s, the natives of the New Hebrides were indeed superstitious, violent cannibals. But rather than allow this kind of sentiment to scare him away from his purpose... Instead, this is what Peyton replied. He said, Mr. Dixon, this was the protester, Mr. Dixon, you are advanced in years now and your own prospect is soon to be laid in the grave, there to be eaten by worms. I confess to you that if I can but live and die serving and honoring the Lord Jesus, it will make no difference to me whether I am eaten by cannibals or by worms. And in the great day, my resurrection body will rise as fair as yours in the likeness of our risen Redeemer. I don't know if Mr. Peyton was thinking about 1 Peter when he he spoke those words. But that that kind of of sentiment, it, it sums up perfectly what our passage is speaking about this morning. See, Peyton, John G. Peyton, he he knew the possibility of death, but he resolved to go anyway because he was prepared to suffer for the sake of Christ. Or as Peter words it, he was armed with this way of thinking. There's, if you look in verse 1, there is one imperative or one command in our passage this morning. It's this, one overarching command. It's found in verse 1. Arm yourselves. Arm yourselves. This is the one command that follows through the entire passage. This is a military term. This verb, it's only found here in the New Testament. But wherever this this word is found in its noun form, everywhere else in the New Testament, it's translated as weapon or instrument. And so... Peter, who has already told believers in chapter 1, verse 13, to to gird up the loins of their minds, this 
this picture is a, the, the act of a soldier tucking his tunic into his belt in order to, to maneuver and fight. Now, Peter, he, he tells them to pick up their weapon. Arm yourself. And so we have to answer the question, what is that weapon which we, with which we are to arm ourselves? If we're to arm ourselves, what are we supposed to arm ourselves with? Well, in the context of this passage, I believe that arming yourself means that it is the readiness and resolve to suffer for the gospel. It's the readiness and the resolve to suffer for the gospel. And I think we can just, right right in this moment, thank God for his providence in bringing this passage before us the week after Jay led us through the study of John 15, verse 18 through 16, verse 4 last week. We need to hear this, and we need to hear this often. Because persecution and suffering is intensifying for us in this country, and we are soft. We are soft. You may be old enough to remember the religious right movement and Ronald Reagan, or you may... Remember the conservative resurgence in the SBC in the 80s? And those were glory days. But since then, we have grown fat and lazy and comfortable and completely unprepared for what's on the horizon. We're like the 50-year-old, 300-pound couch potato still boasting about his glory days as the star athlete in high school. Those days are gone, brother. What about now? And so we need to take a good, hard look in the mirror and ask ourselves, am I mentally and spiritually prepared, armed to suffer for the sake of the gospel? Now, that's not to say that that you may not have experienced persecution before. You've probably been made fun of. You've maybe lost a friend or two, you, you, maybe your holidays are awkward because there's that one family member who is just hostile against the gospel. But I'm talking about the near future reality, unless the Lord is gracious to our country, of you losing your job or being monitored and censored, maybe even facing jail time for being a Christian. Count on it, if it was legal to kill Christians in this country, people would kill Christians today. So we need to arm ourselves deliberately, purposefully, now. Arm ourselves, prepared, resolved to suffer so that when persecution, in in whatever form it takes, comes into our lives, we'll be found ready. This isn't the kind of thing that it hits and then you get ready. You need to get ready right now so that when it comes in the near future, you will already be armed. You'll already have your weapon in your hand. And so Peter, he gives the command, arm yourselves. Ready, prepared to suffer for the sake of Christ. But he doesn't only give us a command, he also shows us the way. So we know the what. Arm yourselves. Ready yourselves to suffer. We know what, but now we have to consider the how. Are we to beat on our chest and let out a war cry to psych ourselves up like before a football game? Is that how we ready ourselves? The rest of our passage, the rest of our time this morning is what we will be focusing on, the, the how. The how to arm ourselves. This is how we'll focus on these verses today. And so in these verses, in these six verses before us in 1 Peter chapter 4, I want us to see three ways in which we are to mentally and spiritually arm ourselves to suffer. Three ways in which we are to mentally and spiritually arm ourselves in order to suffer. So let's look again at our passage. In the first way, in which we are to arm ourselves, you are to arm yourself by considering Jesus. Arm yourself by considering Jesus. Look at the first half of verse 1 again. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, 
some manuscripts add for you or for us. Since, therefore, Christ suffered in the flesh for you, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. This, this phrase, it draws us back to chapter 3, verse 18. Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. We're supposed to have that ringing in our ears as we read this phrase in chapter 4. Christ suffered for sinners. He suffered unjustly. He was persecuted and he was put to death as a sacrificial offering for you, for us. Since this happened to Jesus, we too, Peter says, we too must arm ourselves with this way of thinking. And this reminds us of Jay's sermon last week and of Jesus' words in John 15, 18 and, and, and verse 20. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. The world hates Jesus. The world is not neutral. The, the world is not trying to make up its mind. The world hates Jesus. The world persecuted Jesus. The world will hate you. The world will persecute you. Arm yourself with this reality. If you want to be a disciple of Jesus, and by that I, I mean someone who wants to follow the real Jesus, not, not the made-up Jesus who believes that love is love, or that a woman has a right to kill her unborn baby and would make a perfect Democrat, not, not, not that Jesus. No, if you, if you want to follow the real Jesus, the one who called down holy fire from heaven upon the homosexuals in Sodom and Gomorrah, the real Jesus who said, as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, the murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers and idolaters and all liars whose portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. If you want to follow that Jesus who was murdered at the hands of sinners because he exposed their sin, then count on it. You will also suffer. So consider that Jesus suffered. But consider that Jesus suffered for you. Consider that Jesus suffered for you. Remember the gospel. Remember the gospel. Why is this important when preparing to suffer? Why, why does Peter want to lead off with this? Consider Jesus, since Jesus suffered. He wants to draw your attention back to the gospel so, so that you'll arm yourselves to suffer because when, when trials come, when suffering come, you need to remember that your sin is paid for. When you're, when you're facing a, a loaded gun, when you're facing prison time, when you're facing the, the scaffold, when you're facing the gallows, when, when you're facing whatever suffering comes your way and, and you see this danger right in front of you, you need in, in your mind to always be saturated with the gospel and, and know that whatever enemy you're facing, whatever, whatever opposition, whatever danger you're facing, your biggest threat has already been taken care of. Your sin has been paid for in full. There is no hell waiting for you. Jesus already tasted all of hell for you on the cross. And so you don't have to fear. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You have been set free. You have been justified. You are not guilty. You've been reconciled to God. Consider that Jesus suffered in your place for you. And so death is not the end for you. Whatever persecution comes your way, it's not the end for you. And you can face it knowing that Jesus has already taken all, all, of, the, all of your enemies away. The outcome is secure for you. So consider that Jesus suffered for you. But we're supposed to arm ourselves with this same way of thinking as Jesus. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. 
So what was Jesus' way of thinking when he suffered? When he was being mocked, when he was being beaten, when he went to the cross, what was his way of thinking? I think we get a glimpse of this if we just turn back to chapter 2 and look at verses 22 and 23. Peter gives us insight into Jesus' way of thinking here. He says, he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. But here, I think this is the key to this is the way of thinking that Jesus had when he suffered. But he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He didn't retaliate. He didn't, he didn't mock back. He, he didn't call down uh, legions of angels upon those who were persecuting him. He entrusted himself to God. Entrusted himself to God. He, he knew that this was God's purpose and plan. He knew that, that he was innocent. He, he knew that, that all of the, the, the hostility, all, the, all the, these accusations, that they weren't founded on anything. And so he entrusted himself to God. Consider that Christ suffered, and so you'll suffer too. Settle that in your mind. If you want to follow Jesus, they persecuted him, they'll persecute you. They hated him, they'll hate you. Consider that. But consider that Jesus suffered for you. He suffered for you in your place. Consider the way in which he, he suffered, entrusting himself to God. Brothers and sisters, we are called to suffer Peter writes that in, in chapter 2, verse 21. For to this you have been called to suffer unjustly. Arm yourselves. Prepare yourselves for this, considering Jesus your master. A servant is not greater than his master. He suffered, you will suffer. Consider Jesus and entrust yourself to God. Arm yourselves with the same way of thinking that Jesus had. Arm yourselves, prepare yourselves to suffer by considering Christ. But look at the rest of that verse in chapter 4, verse 1. We're to arm ourselves not only by considering Christ, but we are to arm ourselves, arm yourself by deliberately pursuing righteousness. Arm yourself by deliberately pursuing righteousness. Look at the rest of the verse. He says, since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Christ suffered, so arm yourselves, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Now this is a difficult phrase. This is, this is the most difficult phrase in this passage, I think. I, I was, as I was studying, I was preparing myself for verse 6 because verse 6 is controversial, but I couldn't get past verse 1 because this phrase is incredibly difficult and it has been interpreted in, in different ways. But there's two dangers that we need to avoid when we look at this, this passage. So before I tell you what, what it means, I need to tell you what it doesn't mean. Because there's two dangers in which you, you might find yourself leaning towards. The first danger is known as asceticism. Asceticism, this is the idea that by, by depriving yourselves of physical needs or physical pleasures such as food, or, or by suffering afflictions, you'll become sanctified. So if you deprive yourselves of food, then God will be happy with you. If you... If you become a monk, if you hide away in a convent, then God will look favorably upon you. This is what Martin Luther, as Jay was telling us about earlier, this is what Martin Luther was trying to do. He was trying to afflict himself to try to earn some kind of merit, some kind of favor with God. And so when he traveled to Rome, and he traveled to the, the steps of Pilate where Jesus was um, it was said, it was thought that Jesus himself had stood on these stairs. Luther got down on his knees and he crawled up these stairs on his hands and knees. 
praying the rosary as he went up because he thought that somehow this would earn some kind of favor with God. He was afflicting himself. When he got to the top, he realized that he was no nearer to God than he was when he was at the bottom. Paul writes this in Colossians chapter 2, verses 20 through 23. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch referring to things that all perish as they are used. So he's talking about food. He's talking about marriage and sex. He's talking about all these things that are good in themselves. But these people are, are trying to teach the Christians in Colossia that if you deprive yourselves of these, then you'll be more spiritual. You'll be more ho holy. According to human precepts and teachings, this is, and here in verse 23, this is Paul's, the Apostle Paul's final verdict on this. He says, these have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. It may look good if you hear of someone that's been fasting for all week to try to get closer to God, someone who, who is afflicting bodily harm on themselves because they think that somehow they'll, they'll earn some kind of merit but what Paul says is that these look good, and it's self-made religion. It's, it's man's way of trying to get close to God, but it does nothing to stop the passions of your flesh. It does nothing to actually merit any kind of favor or to do anything except to um, promote self-righteousness. And so this is not what Peter is talking about here. So whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. He's not saying that if you afflict yourself in the flesh that you'll be any closer to getting rid of sin than you were before. Paul has already discounted that in Colossians chapter 2. But the second danger is what's known as perfectionism. And this is the idea that a Christian can attain sinlessness in this life. This was held by people like John Wesley or, or Charles Finney that they believed that somehow Christians could progress in such a way that they would eventually reach sinless perfection. But this is soundly refuted by, by nearly every New Testament writer. All we have to do is go to 1 John. We, we just have to flip a couple of pages from, from Peter to 1 John to see that there is an expectation that Christians are still going to struggle with sin in this life. If we say we have no sin, then we make God to be a liar if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. Paul himself struggled with sin in Romans chapter 7. We see that there is ongoing struggle, battle with the old man, with the flesh in this life. And so we don't need to, to think that somehow we'll be perfect in this life. And if I don't make perfection in this life, that it means I'm not a Christian or I haven't done something right. That, that's not what Peter is talking about here. He's not talking about sinless perfection. Those are interpretations to avoid. So, so what does it mean? What does it mean? Whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Because the grammar is difficult. But I think we go back to the beginning of the verse. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. We have to go back to the way that Jesus was thinking. He was resolved to suffer. Why? Because he was determined to obey his father no matter the cost. This was Jesus' mindset. He was determined. No matter that there was a cross in his path, he was going to do the will of his father no matter what. We can see this in Luke chapter 9, verse 51. When the day drew near for him, Jesus, to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. He set his face to go and obey the father all the way to death. We can see this in Isaiah chapter 50 which is one of the servant songs of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 50, verses 4 through 7. The Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are taught. This is Jesus speaking in the Old Testament. This is the servant of the Lord speaking. The Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are taught 
that I may know how to sustain with a word him who is weary. Morning by morning he awakens, he awakens my ear to hear as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear and I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. I I was not rebellious, I was obedient. And this obedience led to verse 6 in Isaiah 50. I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. But the Lord God helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like a flint. Jesus is a stone. He cannot be moved from his purpose. He will be obedient no matter what. And I think that's what Peter is driving at in verse 1. Arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. If we're to arm ourselves with this way of thinking, I think we can understand what he's saying here in verse 1 this way. The one who suffers hostility from the world is the one who is also demonstrating the desire to cease from sin. The one who suffers hostility from the world is the one who is also demonstrating the desire to cease from sin. Or, Or we can word it this way. The person who has resolved to suffer persecution demonstrates this by breaking with sinful pursuits of the world and deliberately pursues righteousness. Let me say that again. I really want you guys to grasp this because it's a difficult phrase. The person who has resolved to suffer persecution demonstrates this by breaking with sinful pursuits of the world and deliberately pursues righteousness. Look at verse 2. I think this helps expand the idea. So as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. Holy living and suffering go hand in hand. Holy living and suffering go hand in hand. Because how can you say you'll die for Jesus if you won't stop looking at porn for him? How how can you be resolved to suffer for the sake of Christ when you can't be resolved to spend time in prayer because you're too busy watching TV or scrolling through Facebook? You say you'll suffer for Christ, but you won't suffer the guy who cuts you off in traffic or who is rude to you. You say you'll suffer for Christ, but you can't stop complaining about your boss behind his back. You say you'll suffer for Christ, but you're constantly critical and harsh to your children. Do you see the disconnect? It's easy for us to say, oh, I will go with you, Jesus. I will die with you, Jesus. Every day, Jesus calls us to die to ourselves. And if you won't die to yourselves in your day-to-day living by taking up your cross and following Jesus then you are demonstrating by those facts that when it comes to you climbing the steps to that scaffold, you will not die for Jesus. Listen, you can't serve two masters. You can't serve two masters. James says friendship with the world is enmity with God. If you want to arm yourself, ready to suffer, put away sin. Put away sin. Don't afflict yourself in the flesh. Afflict yourself in your heart. Your heart is evil and it craves after the passions of this world. Put those desires to death. Demonstrate your, your, your readiness to suffer. By killing the sin that that raises its ugly head in your life every single day. Again, this isn't saying sinless perfectionism. For complete sanctification, it only comes at death. But you must resolve not to walk in darkness. Not to habitually and regularly indulge in human passions. But instead to pursue the will of God. That's what Peter is talking about here. A readiness to suffer is demonstrated 
by a readiness, a deliberate pursuit of righteousness. And this is a visible, noticeable difference. Look in verse 3. He says, for the time that is past, that's before you were a believer, the time that is past suffices. It's more than enough time. In other words, don't, don't pine over your past life as if you wish that you could go back. Don't, don't look at the wicked, the unbeliever, and say, man, it looks like they're having a good time. I wish I could do that, but darn it, I'm a Christian. The time that's past suffices. It's enough. Jesus says in Luke chapter 9, verse 62, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. So the time before you were a Christian was enough. It suffices. Whether, whether you became a Christian at 7 or 70, the time is enough. <coughs> the time that has passed suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do. Living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. Time before you're a Christian, that, that's time enough for you to do what the Gentiles want to do. And it's it's telling we could just go off on this trail, him calling unbelievers Gentiles. It reminds us, going back to chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, that, that believers united in Christ who is true Israel, believers, we are true Israel of God. We are the true Israel. And the Gentiles are the unbelievers. Don't walk as a Gentile anymore because now you are a true Jew. You are a true Israelite. You've been separated from that way of life. You are a new creation. So don't go back doing what the Gentiles love to do. And what is it that they love to do? Well, they love to, to live for sensuality. That's the pursuit of physical and especially sexual pleasure. They pursue passions, these lust. They pursue drunkenness and orgies that could be translated as revelings, drinking parties, lawless idolaters. In other words, the unbelievers, they like to party. Look back through that list. This, this, this is party language. They love to party. They would go to a temple and have out-of-control parties filled with drunkenness and sex. It, it would have been like a frat party on any given Saturday at hundreds of colleges across the country. Movies and TV shows are made about this kind of lifestyle. There are, are rap songs and hip-hop and country songs that are devoted to glorifying this kind of lifestyle. It, it's this party language. And, and the world would have you believe that this unbridled, consequence-free sexual carnival is the ultimate bliss. But Peter says, don't join in with that. The time, the time that's passed, it suffices for that. It's enough. Don't, don't pursue these kinds of pleasures anymore. And when believers don't join in, the Gentiles, it says in verse 4, it says, respect to, with, respect to this, with respect to this lifestyle, when you don't join in, they are surprised. The King James Version says, they think it's strange. They think it's strange when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you. See, the world thinks it's strange when you don't join in. That, that word, join in, it, it's, it's this idea of running together or being in league with or being in harmony with. It's coming alongside and going headlong in the same direction to the same goal. The world thinks it's strange when you don't join in with them, when you don't run along with them in their flood of debauchery. Debauchery is not a word that we use very often. You probably only come across it when you read through the New Testament. Debauchery, it's this, it's this overindulgence in sensual and physical pleasures. Debauchery, it, it's, it's living for now. It's living for your own personal pleasures. It's, it's living for, for your own lust. It's giving in to your animal cravings. And Peter says that the world, it, it's going in this flood of debauchery. It, it's just 
Everything is all about physical pleasure. Turn on TV and watch TV shows. You'll see exactly what Peter's talking about as the world is just going in a flood of debauchery. It's not a slow drip. It's not, it's not a little pleasant stream. It's a flood. It's, it's the dam has broken and the world is given over to all manner of filth and unrighteousness. This word debauchery, it's, it's used of the prodigal son in Luke 15, verse 13. But there it's translated as reckless living. It's sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It's booze and women and all manner of, of, of recklessness. The world expects everyone to join in on this party bus. That's what the world expects. Uh, hey, I'm given over to, to just doing whatever feels good. You, you should do it too. You should join in. And when the believer doesn't, when the believer is not, not completely self-absorbed in, in his or her own pleasure like the rest of the world, they think it's strange. And they malign you. In the first century, these these drinking parties, these festivals, they were the way that they worshipped their pagan gods. These guilds, they, they were devoted to a particular god in the pantheon. Zeus or, or, or Hermes or, or whoever it was, Aphrodite's. And they'd have these parties, these festivals. They'd go and they'd eat and they'd drink and, and they, would, um, they would indulge in sexual immorality. And so for the Christian to refuse to join in, it, it was, they viewed it as, you're snubbing the gods. Are you crazy? You're not worshiping the gods. They're, they're, they're going to get angry at us. And so the believers, they were often blamed whenever there was an earthquake or whenever there was a famine or a drought because they'd angered the gods. Our society might not blame us for droughts and famine yet, <laughs> Though I did see uh, someone on Twitter a few weeks ago blaming Christians for the California wildfires. Our society might not be full-blown in blaming us when there's some kind of natural disaster yet, though that's coming. But they will blame us for taking away their rights. They'll blame us as if we're not compassionate to women if we speak against abortion. They'll label us as bigots or misogynists or homophobes. And so they'll malign us. That word, it, it literally is translated, they'll blaspheme us. They'll blaspheme us. One commentator talking about this passage, he said the Christians were compelled to stand aloof from all the social pleasures of the world and the Gentiles bitterly resented their puritanism regarding them as the enemies of all joy and therefore of the human race. But persecution and suffering of this kind, it only comes when you're resolved to live righteously. Paul writing in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12 says, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted no one is going to persecute Hillsong Pastor Carl Lentz for not calling abortion a sin when asked on The View. No one's going to persecute him for that. No one's going to persecute the many pastors in the Presbyterian Church of America who supported the Revoice Conference and their support of same-sex attracted Christians. You won't be persecuted for affirming what the world already believes. You'll only suffer when you call sin what the world seeks to normalize. Arming yourself to suffer means resolving to make a break with the world and deliberately pursuing righteousness. If you are pursuing holiness, it demonstrates a willingness and readiness to suffer. If you want to arm yourself, if you want to prepare yourself mentally and spiritually for suffering, deliberately pursue righteousness. 
deliberately. It can't be accidental. You're not going to fall into righteousness. You'll fall into sin. You have to deliberately pursue righteousness. So consider Jesus. Deliberately pursue righteousness. And finally, in verses 5 and 6, arm yourself by looking beyond momentary pleasures to eternal glory. Arm yourself by looking beyond momentary pleasure to eternal glory. See, this is what the world thinks when it hears passages like this. And I think a lot of professing Christians read it this way too. Don't get drunk. Well, drinking is fun and there's no harm to it. So if you're telling me not to drink, you're telling me not to have any fun. Don't sleep around. The world says sleeping around is fun. Don't be a prude. We can do what we want. So you telling me I can't indulge in whatever sexual relationship I want to indulge in means that you are trying to restrict me and you're taking away my fun. Don't live for pleasure. Don't, don't, don't let that be your all-consuming goal to, to pursue pleasure. The world says we're stardust. We're free to do whatever we want so long as it doesn't hurt anyone. And so, as that commentator said, they view Christians as the enemy of all joy. They view Christians as the enemy of all joy. But the scriptures tell us that pursuing righteousness does not mean living dreary and joyless lives. That's not what the scriptures are teaching. When you read this and it says, don't join in with the Gentiles in doing all these things, it doesn't mean that the, the Bible is trying to strip you of all joy. It's trying to get you to orient your life towards true joy, towards real joy, towards lasting joy. So you live in God's world, and your neighbor lives in God's world, your, your, your co-workers, your fellow students. We all together live in God's world. And God has designed his world to operate to function in a specific way. And, and when you orient your life to the way in which God has designed the world to work, the Bible says you're living wisely. But when you live in opposition to the way that God has designed the world to work, the Bible says that you are a fool. This is the book of Proverbs. When it says this distinction between the wise and the foolish wisdom and folly, it's talking about you're living in God's world. He's designed it in a certain way. He's designed you in a certain way to function in this world. And when you push back against that and you try to go your own way, you're a fool. You're living foolishly. See, when a machine or a computer program, it doesn't operate as it was intended to, we call it a glitch. We call it a glitch. And when you live in this world and you're designed to live in this world in a certain way and you, you don't, you're glitching. You're not living according to the way God has designed it. The, the sensuality, the passions and drunkenness and orgies and drinking parties and, and idolatry of verse 3, it, it's all intended to numb and distract you from, from this reality. When you sit down and you... you you binge watch a TV show for 12 hours, it's meant to numb your brain to the reality of this world, to the, to the reality of the way in which you're supposed to live. And, and above all, it, it trains us to ignore the reality that there's a coming judgment. Look at verse 5. The Gentiles, they're, they're living in this, this, this party-like reveling way they think it's strange when you don't join in. But Peter says, but they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Unbelievers wish to live however they please in unbridled passions, but they cannot escape the fact that they must give an account to Christ who is the judge. Jesus tells parables about... Servants, he, he gives parables about a master who's going away on a long journey and he gives these, this money to these servants and he goes away. And, and when he comes back, the servants have to give an account. And the ones who are faithful and wise, 
they've made more money for the master, but the foolish one is the one that, that ignored the reality that his master was coming back. He ignored the reality that he was going to have to give an account, and he was thrown out. Your kids will act a certain way when you're not in the room, am I right? They'll live in, in a certain way when daddy's not home. Daddy goes to work. They act like complete fools, right? Unbridled animals. And what does mom say? Wait till I tell your father. Right? That's the threat, right? Daddy's coming home. And there will be a reckoning. This world wants to live however it wants free of all consequences, free of all restrictions, and they are blind to the truth that Christ is coming. That there is going to be judgment. And they may have lived their short lives in unbridled pleasure, but they will spend eternity in torment. They will spend eternity in separated from the only joy that they should have pursued. What about believers? What about believers? See, from the world's standpoint, there's no benefit to being a Christian. The Christian dies just like the non-Christian. We just don't have as much fun getting there. Right? We, we both end up in the ground... But the unbeliever gets to do whatever they want. The Christian has been restricted. But we both end up in the same place. And so the world ridicules us. Who cares? Who cares? But there is a different viewpoint in verse 6. This is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead. That though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. This has been a controversial verse with some suggesting that there's a second chance to believe the gospel after death or that Peter is talking only about spiritually dead people. So the gospel was preached to people who have already died. That They often want to try to connect that back to chapter 3, verse 19. But I think that the NIV does a good job when it inserts the word now. This is why the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead. I, I think that there's little doubt that Peter has physical death in mind here. In verse 5, he talks about Christ judging the living and the dead. In verse 6, he talks about those who are dead. I think that he's still talking about those who are physically dead. But they're now dead. But when they heard and believed the gospel, they were still living. So he's dealing with this objection from the unbelieving world. The unbelieving world that says, who cares? What, what, what difference does Christianity make? You're going to die anyway. Why don't you just live this reckless life just like the rest of us? Why do you have to be so weird? Why do you have to be so strange? Why, why can't you just give in? And Peter says... The gospel has been preached to those who are now dead. They did die. They, they died just like everyone else. They're judged in the flesh the way people are. The wages of sin is death. You and I, unless Christ returns before, we will all physically die. And your unbelieving neighbor or friend or coworker or family member, they too will die. But see, the difference is found in the rest of the verse. They're judged in the flesh the way people are, but they've had the gospel preached to them so that they might live in the spirit the way God does. There's a parallel to chapter 3, verse 18. Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Notice this, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Christ suffered in the flesh. He died, but he was made alive by the power of the Holy Spirit. He was raised. He was resurrected 
Christians die like everyone else in the flesh, but they too will be made alive in the spirit. What is the difference between the believer and the unbeliever in regards to the way we live? Resurrection. It's resurrection. Revelation chapter 14, verse 13. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors for their deeds. Follow them. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is all about the resurrection. There are people in Corinth that are saying, yes, Christ has been raised, but we won't. And so Paul is arguing for resurrection against these people who are saying there's no resurrection. He says in verse 32 that if there is no resurrection, if the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. So, so in 1 Peter chapter 4, if there is no resurrection, then, then why not just join in with the Gentiles? Why not just join them in uh, with their flood of debauchery? Paul says Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. There is a difference between the unbeliever and the believer. There is a reason why we pursue righteousness. It's because of resurrection. It's because of resurrection. How can you arm yourself to suffer? By realizing that there's more to your existence than these 60, 70, 80 years on earth. These momentary pleasures that come from reckless living all have to be accounted for. Even the suffering and hostility we face are momentary and transient. But we ought to count them as nothing next to the eternal weight of glory we will experience when Christ raises these frail mortal bodies to glorious immortal ones. Christ died. He died for sinners. There is a dead Savior for you. There is a sacrifice for you if you would only repent of your sins and come to Christ. There is also a Savior who lives. He lives. He, he's been raised physically from the grave. He lives, and because He lives, you too will live. And Christ will come again. He will come. It has been almost 2,000 years, but He will come. And he will judge the living and the dead. And all those who are trusting in him will be raised to eternal glorified life. And so arm yourself by looking beyond momentary pleasures and seeing the reality of eternal glory. Eternal resurrected glory for all those who trusted in Christ. Arm yourself in this way. John G. Payton, he wasn't eaten by cannibals. He suffered immensely as a missionary. Immensely. The, the deaths of family members, disease, weakness. But ultimately he died in Australia at the age of 82. But let me close with another missionary that you may have heard on the news. His name was John Chow. John was an American student who had a desire to take the gospel to the Sentinelese tribal people on North Sentinel Island in the Bay of Bengal between India and Myanmar. The Sentinelese people, they have no contact with the outside world. Zero. They are the most isolated people group on the face of the planet. In fact, the, the government of India, they have made it illegal to make contact with these people there's this fear that any kind of disease that an outsider would bring to the tribe would just decimate them. 
But it's also illegal to contact them because the tribe is hostile, incredibly hostile to outsiders. They've made it abundantly clear that they do not want to be contacted. They don't want to have any dealings with outsiders. As evidence, in 2006, two fishermen were stranded on the shore and the tribal people, they killed them. And yet John Chow, he wanted to go. He wanted to take the gospel to them. And so in 2018, he bribed some fishermen because it was illegal for the fishermen to take him. They were arrested, but he bribed them to take him to this island. And when he tried to make contact, the tribe's people, they attacked him. He said a little boy shot an arrow at him, and it would have struck him in the chest if his Bible hadn't been there, and the the arrow went into his Bible, it would have killed him. And so he had to run for his life. They chased him off the island. He had to swim a mile to get back to the boat. He wrote in his diary, you guys might think I'm crazy in all this, but I think it's worth it to declare Jesus to these people. He knew the possibility of death. It was staring him in the eyes. This was not hypothetical. It was not, it was not, you'll be eaten by cannibals rhetoric. He had actually experienced near death. And yet he wanted to go back. And in his final letter that he left to his family, he left it with the fishermen to give to his family. One of his final sentences was, don't try to recover my body. And he went back, and on November 16th, 2018, they murdered him there on the shore. And his body was never recovered because you can't go onto the island without being attacked. This question has haunted me all week. Who's going to take the gospel to the Sentinelese people? How will they believe on one in whom they've never heard? And how will they hear unless someone preaches to them? Who is going to take the gospel to these people? It's going to have to be someone who's armed with this way of thinking. Prepared and ready to suffer. And so my question to you is, are you? Are you ready to suffer? Do you have it settled in your mind that to live for Jesus is to be ready to suffer even death for the sake of Christ? Have you considered Jesus? If you're here and you've never trusted in Christ, you have to stop right there. Consider Jesus, the Savior, the perfect Holy One who came and lived a perfect life and died a substitutionary death. Won't you believe on him? There is no reconciliation with God outside of Christ. But for you who are believers, consider Christ. Consider what he's done for you. Consider his own suffering. Consider that he was entrusting himself to God. Are you resolved to suffer for him? Are you resolved to pursue righteousness? That demonstrates that you have a willingness and a readiness to suffer. Are you looking in hope to resurrection? Or are you still clinging to this life? Because if you have your eyes set upon Christ, if you are looking forward in hope to eternal glory, then leaving these momentary pleasures, these fleeting pleasures, it won't be a sacrifice. If you're looking forward in hope to eternal glory and resurrection, then you'll be willing to go. You'll be willing to face the arrows and spears and the hostility of unreached people, all for the sake of Christ. But it is worth it. And I pray that God will raise up from amongst us people who will go. But I pray that we will all arm ourselves and be ready to suffer for the sake of Christ. Let's pray.